No, Jackson said with a deprecatory smile. I'm sorry, I don't want to disturb your game, but I'm not playing hide-and-seek either. One Christmas Eve, in the prime of our youth, fourteen of us celebrated the holiday together. We ate well and played silly games that we all enjoyed. All of us, except for Jackson, that is. When someone suggested hide-and-seek, he was the only one who refused to participate. Somebody asked if he was upset, and Jackson replied, No, I feel perfectly fine, thanks, but... He added with a softening smile, I'm not playing hide-and-seek. Why not? Someone asked. Jackson hesitated before replying, Sometimes I stay at a house where a girl was killed. She was playing hide-and-seek in the dark, she was unfamiliar with the house, and when chased, she leapt through a bedroom door. Only, it didn't lead to a bedroom. It led to the servant's staircase. When she jumped, she landed at the bottom of the stairs, her neck broken. We all wore serious expressions, and Mrs. Fernley said, How terrible! Were you there when it happened? Jackson shook his head sadly. No but I was there when something worse happened. What could be worse than that? Mrs. Fernley asked, what we all wondered. This was... Jackson hesitated a moment before continuing. I wonder if any of you have ever played a game called Smee. It's much better than hide-and-seek. The name comes from It's Me. Perhaps you like to play it. Instead... Let me explain the game's rules. Every player is given a sheet of paper, all of which are blank except for one. On the last sheet, the word SME is written. Nobody knows who has the SME paper except for the player holding it. Then, the lights are turned out. SME sneaks away to hide, and after a time, the others disperse in search of SME without knowing who they're looking for. When two players meet, one challenges the other by saying, Smee. The other player answers, Smee, and they continue searching together. But the real Smee doesn't answer. Instead, they remain silent, and the challenger must remain quietly at Smee's side. When the next player challenges Smee, they too receive no answer and join the others. This continues until all the players are in the same place. The last one to find Smee loses. It's a good, noisy, amusing game, and in a big house, it takes a long time for everyone to find Smee. Perhaps you'd like to try. I'll happily sit by the fire while you play. It sounds like a good game. Have you played it too, Jackson? I asked. Yes, I played in the house that I was telling you about, he answered. And she was there? The girl who broke... No, no, he said he wasn't there when she broke her neck, someone else said. Jackson thought for a moment. I don't know if I was there or not, but I'm afraid she was. I know there were 13 of us playing, and only 12 people were in the house. I didn't know the dead girl's name. When I heard it being whispered in the dark, it didn't frighten me. But I'm never playing that kind of game again. It made me nervous for a long time. We all stared at him. His words made no sense at all. Tim Voos was the kindest man in the world. He smiled at us. This sounds like an interesting story. Come on, Jackson. You can tell it to us, he said. Very well, Jackson agreed, and the following is his story as he told it. Have you met the Sangstons? They're my cousins and they live in Surrey. Five years ago, they invited me to spend Christmas with them. It was an old house with lots of unnecessary hallways and staircases. A stranger could easily get lost. Well, Violet Sangston promised that I knew most of the other guests, but unfortunately, I couldn't get away from work until Christmas Eve. The other guests had all arrived the previous day, and I was the last. I said hello to everyone I knew, and Violet introduced me to those I didn't. Then, it was time for dinner. 
That may be why I didn't hear the name of the tall, beautiful, dark-haired girl I had never met. Everyone was in a hurry, and I'm bad at catching names. She looked cold and clever, not friendly, but definitely interesting, and I wondered who she was. I didn't ask. I was sure someone would say her name during the meal. Unfortunately, I was seated too far away next to Mrs. Gorman, and she was being her usual bright and amusing self. It's always worth listening when she speaks, and I forgot to ask the proud girl's name. There were twelve of us, including the Sangstons. We were all young, or trying to be young. Jack and Violet Sangston were the oldest, and their seventeen-year-old son Reggie was the youngest. It was he who suggested Smee when the talk turned to game. Please be careful of the back stairs on the first floor. They're concealed behind a door. I've often thought of removing it. In the dark, a stranger can think they're walking into a room. A girl once broke her neck on those stairs. I asked him how it happened. It was about ten years ago, before we moved here. There was a party and they were playing hide-and-seek. The girl was looking for a place to hide when she heard someone coming and ran away. She opened the door, planning to duck inside the bedroom until the seeker passed. Unfortunately, it was the door that led to the back stairs, and she fell straight down to the bottom. She was dead when they picked her up. We all promised to be careful. Mrs. Gorman even made a little joke about living to be 90. After all, none of us had known the poor girl, and we didn't want to feel sad on Christmas Eve. We started the game immediately after dinner. Reggie turned off all the lights except the ones in the servants' rooms and the sitting room we were in. Then, we prepared eleven sheets of blank paper and one with the word Smee written on it. Reggie mixed them all up and we each took one. The person who got the Smee paper would have to hide, but mine was blank. A moment later, the sitting room lights were turned off and I heard someone quietly moving towards the door. A minute later, someone blew a whistle, and we all hurried to begin the search. I had no idea who Smee was. For five or ten minutes, we were all rushing up and down hallways and in and out of rooms, challenging each other and answering, Smee? Smee? Eventually, the noise died down, and I knew someone had found Smee. I found a group of people sitting on some narrow stairs and received no answer to my challenge. Smee was there. I hurriedly joined the group and soon two more players arrived. Jack Sangston was last and had to forfeit. I think we're all here now, aren't we? He remarked, lighting a match. Looking up the staircase, he began to count. Nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen. That's silly. There's one too many, he laughed. When the match went out, he lit another and counted again. He got as far as twelve, then looked puzzled. There are thirteen people here, he exclaimed. I haven't counted myself yet. Oh, nonsense. You probably started with yourself and now you're trying to count yourself twice, <laughs> I laughed. Reggie took out his flashlight. It was much brighter than a match and we all began to count. Of course, there were twelve of us. Well, I was sure I counted thirteen twice, <laughs> Jack laughed. From halfway up the stairs, Violet spoke nervously. I thought someone was sitting two steps above me. Have you moved, Captain Ransom? The captain said he hadn't, but thought somebody was sitting between him and Mrs. Sangston. Just for a moment... Something uncomfortable lingered in the air. A cold finger seemed to touch us all. At that moment, it felt as if something odd and unpleasant had happened and was likely to happen again. Then, we laughed at ourselves, at each other, until we felt normal again. There were only twelve of us, and that was that. Still laughing, we marched back to the sitting room to start a new round. This time, I was Smee, 
But Violet found me while I was searching for a hiding place. That game didn't last long. Soon there were twelve people, and the round was over. Violet felt cold and wanted her coat, so Jack went upstairs to retrieve it. As soon as he'd gone, Reggie touched me on the arm. He looked pale and sick. Quick! I've got to talk to you. Something terrible has happened, he whispered. We went into the breakfast room, and I asked him what was wrong. Uh, I don't know. You were Smee last time, weren't you? Obviously, I didn't know who it was. While everyone else ran to the west side and found you, I went east. There's a deep clothes cupboard in my room, and it seemed like a good hiding place. I opened the door in the dark and felt somebody's hand, and they didn't answer my challenge. I thought I'd found Smee. I don't understand, but I suddenly had a strange cold feeling. I felt like something was wrong. When I turned on my flashlight, nobody was there. But I'm sure I touched a hand, and no one would have gotten out of the cupboard because I was standing in the doorway. So, what do you think? He asked. You imagine touching a hand, I said. He gave a short laugh. (laughs) I knew you would say that. Of course I imagined it. That's the only explanation, isn't it? I agreed, but he was clearly still shaken. We returned to the sitting room where the others were waiting to play the next round of Smee. Perhaps it was my imagination, although I'm almost sure that it wasn't, but I sensed that no one wanted to play anymore. They were simply too polite to say it. All the fun had gone out of the game. Something deep inside was trying to warn me. Take care, it whispered. Take care. I felt like there was some unnatural, unhealthy influence at work. But why did I feel this way? Because Jack counted 13 people instead of 12? Because his son imagined touching someone's hand? I tried to laugh at myself, but couldn't. We started again. While chasing Smee, we were as noisy as ever, but it seemed like most of us were just acting. At first, I stayed with the others, but when several minutes passed with no sign of Smee, I left the main group to search on the west side of the first floor. It was there. While feeling my way along, I bumped into a pair of knees. I reached out my hand to touch a soft, heavy curtain and knew where I was. There were tall, deep windows with floor-length curtains and benches at the end of the passage. Somebody was sitting in the corner on one of the benches, concealed behind a curtain. I thought, Aha! I've caught Smee! So, I pulled the curtain to one side and touched a woman's arm. It was a dark, moonless night outside, so I couldn't actually see the woman sitting there. Smee, I whispered. There was no reply. When Smee is challenged, they can't answer. So, I sat down beside her to wait, and I whispered, What's your name? Out of the darkness, the whisper said, Brenda Ford. I didn't know the name, but instantly guessed who she was. I knew every girl's name in the house except for one, and she was tall and pale with dark hair. So, here she was, sitting on the bench beside me between a heavy curtain and a window. I was beginning to enjoy the game, and I wondered if she was enjoying it too. I whispered one or two rather ordinary questions, but received no answer. Smee is a game of silence. It's a rule that Smee and the ones who find Smee must not talk. This makes it harder for the others to find them, but there was nobody else around. I spoke again, but still received no reply, and I wondered why she insisted on remaining silent. I began feeling a little annoyed, thinking she may be one of those cold, clever girls who have poor opinions of all men, like she was using the rules as an excuse to ignore me. Well... If she didn't want to sit with me, I certainly didn't want to sit with her. I turned away, hoping someone found us soon. Sitting there, 
I realized I disliked being next to this woman very much, which was strange. The girl I saw at dinner seemed likable. I noticed her and wanted to know more. But now, I was really uncomfortable with her. It felt like something wrong. Something unnatural was looming. I remember touching her arm and trembling with horror. I wanted to jump up and run away. I prayed that someone else would come along soon. Just then, I heard light footsteps in the hall and someone on the other side of the curtain brushed against my knees. The curtain moved to one side and a woman's hand touched my shoulder. Smee, whispered a familiar voice. It was Mrs. Gorman, but of course we couldn't answer. She sat beside me and I instantly felt much better. It's Tony Jackson, isn't it? She whispered. Yes, I confirmed. You're not Smee, are you? No, she's on my other side. She reached over me and I heard her fingernails scratch a silk dress as she addressed the woman. Hello, Smee. How are you? Who are you? Oh, it's against the rules to talk. That was exactly how I felt. I didn't say so, but I felt much better. Mrs. Gorman's presence chased away my fears as we sat talking. After a time, we heard footsteps and Reggie's voice shouting, Hello? Hello? Is anybody there? Yes, I answered. Is Mrs. Gorman with you? Yes. What happened to you? You've both lost. We've been waiting for hours. But you haven't found Smee yet, I complained. You mean, you haven't. I was Smee this whole time, Reggie argued. But Smee is here with us, I cried. Yes, Mrs. Gorman agreed. The curtain was pulled back and we sat looking into Reggie's flashlight. I looked at Mrs. Gorman and then on my other side. Between me and the wall was an empty place on the bench. I stood up and immediately sat down again. I felt very sick, and the world was spinning. There was somebody there because I touched her, I insisted. So did I, and I don't think anyone could have left this bench without us knowing, Mrs. Gorman said in a trembling voice. Reggie gave a shaky little laugh, and I remembered his unpleasant experience from earlier that evening. Someone's been playing jokes. Are you coming down? He said. We weren't very popular when we came down to the sitting room. I found the two of them sitting behind a curtain on a window seat, Reggie said. I confronted the tall, dark-haired girl. So you pretended to be Smee and then ran away? I accused her. She shook her head, and afterwards we all played cards in the sitting room, for which I was very glad... But later, Jack wanted to speak with me. I could tell he was rather angry, and he explained why. I suppose you're in love with Mrs. Gorman. That's your business, but please don't make love to her during a game in my house. You kept everyone waiting. It was very rude, and I'm ashamed of you, he said. But we weren't alone. There was somebody else there, someone pretending to be Smee. I think it was that tall girl, Miss Ford. She whispered her name to me. Of course she refused to admit it afterwards, I protested. Jack stared at me. Miss who? He breathed. She said her name was Brenda Ford. Jack put a hand on my shoulder. Look here, Tony. I don't mind a joke, but enough is enough. We don't want to worry the ladies. Brenda Ford is the girl who broke her neck on the stairs. She was playing hide-and-seek here ten years ago.
Hello, my beautiful creepy people. Thank you so much for listening to another episode of Holiday Horrors. Thank you to my very good friend Paige Turner for adapting this classic tale, Smee. If you like what you heard, and I'm sure that you did, please be sure to hit that subscribe button. If you're already subscribed, well, please be sure to share, like, and comment as it helps my channel to grow. Did you know I have a Patreon? Well, I do. A huge shout out to my knights and army of the living dread. Derek Weber, Teddy Dog, Anthony Anderson, Lisa, Lady Dracard, Emma Genta Moonlight. Your overwhelming support means so much to me and I truly appreciate you. Well, that's all for tonight. Stay spooky, my lovelies.